Hello. And I just need to say that I got it to the recording here. <laughs> My name is Eva. Welcome. I'm very glad that you have invited me to zoom in and pre present my PhD trial lecture from October 1st. Uh, and I would just like to add to those of you who might not be familiar with the concept of a trial lecture, that a trial lecture is part of the public defense of the PhD. Um, so I had uh, three opponents that decided upon a topic that I needed to do a lecture on as part of my defense. And the topic was rethinking sustainability for resilience and recovery of tourism in a post pandemic era. So this topic is decided by the committee and not me. Um, I have been looking very much forward to coming today and especially to engage and hopefully talk with a lot of different students from all over the world as Dion has emphasized. Uh, I'm looking at this entire day as a collaborative space within which we will hopefully be able to bring up new conversations or opportunities around tourism in a post pandemic era. I don't think my presentation will take much more than 35 40 minutes, so there will be plenty of time for initial discussions afterwards. As Dian said, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and then we can address them afterwards. And it doesn't have to be hard questions. It can also be alternative perspectives or insights or something you just want to share. So rethinking sustainability for resilience and recovery of tourism in a post pandemic era. That's a broad topic and we cannot fully address it within 40 minutes, but we can begin doing so. It also means that I have had to make, uh, make a series of choices, both in terms of what theory to include, what empirical examples to provide. And just before starting, I would also like to say that it's actually an emotionally draining or heavy topic to work around. COVID-19 is filled with death and suffering in as, in as much as it is filled with opportunity and hope for the future. And with any luck, a post-pandemic era will be a chance to reappreciate how we are, or perhaps could be, all in this together, as here illustrated. I just... So, in March 2020, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic caused by the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 virus, also commonly cushioned as COVID-19. As of September 21st, and still counting, there have globally been more than 229 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. And at the time of talking, we are surpassing 4.7 million deaths related to the disease. And kindly note that these numbers are subject to significant uncertainties due to a lack of testing and monitoring. And in reality, they are likely much higher than noted here. But even though we in Norway and more affluent countries now officially are back to normal, it's important to know that the virus is not yet under control. So as we talk about a post pandemic era, it's filled with uncertainties. In short, the virus is still playing out through an interconnected world and a virus does not know any borders or boundaries. Tourism, however, do. Responding to COVID-19, the mobilities of goods, services, and people came to a near standstill as various containment and mitigation strategies took hold on local, regional, and global scales. And the tourism industry was among the hardest hit industries because tourism is essentially a matter of mobilities. It's about the movement of people. And the graph here illustrates the correlation between new cases of COVID-19 and commercial flights. And you can see a, a rapid decline uh, caused by the COVID-19 outbreak and now a slow rise in commercial flights again. Um, so to contain and mitigate COVID-19, 
countries put restrictions on mobility through what is known as non-pharmaceutical interventions. That include, among others, stay-at-home orders, social distancing, restrictions on, if not even a banning of, domestic and international travel, quarantine requirements and periods, border controls, border closings, and limits on crowding. So removal of these restrictions will be integral to the capacity for tourism to recover because of the extent to which tourism depend on mobility. So the figure you can see here from the United Nations World Tourism Organization is from June. Uh, it was the most recent um, map of the restrictions each country has imposed on travel in October. I'm sure you can go in now and find an, a more updated map. I think they updated every, every three months. Uh, but the logic here is that the darker the color, the more restrictions. So we might not immediately remember it, but COVID-19 is far from the first crisis that tourism has had to recover from. International tourist arrivals have, however, always shown very fast recovery, as illustrated here, comparing earlier crises with early projections of what the impacts of COVID-19 would be like. And you can see here that following the SARS outbreak, growth in international tourist arrivals resumed already after five months. And following the global economic crisis in 2008, growth in international tourist arrivals resumed after 10 months. So none of these past crises led to a long-term decline in the global development of tourism. As such, we can say that tourism has proved to be one of the most resilient activities capable of withstanding terrorism, natural disasters, economic downturns, and even war. But there is much to imply that both the impacts and recovery from COVID-19 is going to be different in both scope and scale. Just consider how the framing of global tourism shifted from over-tourism to non-tourism as vividly illustrated by blogs and newspaper articles that depicted popular tourism destinations or sites before and after COVID-19. These photos you see here are taken by the European Space Agency one year apart, and they show how the waterways of Venice in northern Italy cleared up due to the reduction in boats, water buses, and cruise ships. And this is interesting because COVID-19 is a crisis that also challenges us as tourism researchers, practitioners, or students, in terms of how the recovery of tourism should and perhaps could look like. So as here illustrated, the otherwise forecasted three to 4% growth in international tourism for 2020 quickly became replaced with an unprecedented um, depiction and continued projections of loss in international tourist arrivals. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development has estimated that the impacts of COVID-19 on tourism have cost the world about 4 trillion US dollars and that it has put more than 100 million direct tourism jobs at risk. And just to put these numbers into perspective, the impact here corresponds to the gross domestic product of France. These numbers, however, also shine a light on a highly vulnerable tourism industry because it is the predominantly low paid jobs in the service and tourism sector that has been the hardest hit. And the collapse of the international tourism economy disproportionately impacted tourism dependent small island developing states or the poorer countries relying more on tourism. So 
after we have seen all these statistics and all these numbers and we heard about it in the news, we were left wondering what made the world so vulnerable? What made the tourism industry so vulnerable despite being called resilient? Why were individual countries and the international community not better prepared? How and what kind of changes are needed in order to mitigate harm from future threats? And as we are all wondering now, what's next for tourism? So I would like to talk a bit about the concept of resilience. The concept of resilience date to the late 16th and early 17th centuries and the Latin phrase resilio, which literally translate into to spring back. In terms of meaning, resilience refers to the ability to rebound a bounce back, bounce back sorry, to a normal state or equili equilibrium following change. So resilient theory, resilience theory argue that because all things always change with time, either slowly or rapidly, as we see now with the COVID-19 pandemic, systems, whether a single entity, tourism or the entire planet, must find ways of adapting to their changing context. If not, they will perish or disappear. So while there's not any universally agreed upon definition on resilience, one often used in the tourism literature is the one offered by the Rockefeller Foundation. And it refers to the capacity of individuals, communities and systems to survive, adapt and grow in the face of stress and shock and even transform when the conditions require it. And it's just to emphasize this part of the definition, building resilience is about making people, communities and systems better prepared to withstand catastrophic events, both natural and man-made and be able to bounce back more quickly and emerge even stronger from these shocks and stresses. So what we can conclude already now is that resilience is not a new, new concept. In fact, if anything, resilience has proven to be an extraordinary resilient concept. Already in 2013, the Times coined resilience as the environmental buzzword of the year. And not only has resilience as a concept grown in respect to its usage and application, but we can also say that COVID-19 has afforded it quite the revival. Now, to better understand the processes of resilience and how the concept may give tourism researchers and students an opportunity to enable tourism to bounce back, or should we perhaps say bounce forth, it is worth to take, worth to take a brief look at the resilience adaptive cycle. So the resilience adaptive cycle suggests that there are four general and nonlinear phases of adaption. And these can usefully be applied to the current tourism situation in order to illustrate opportunities and challenges for change and transformation in a post pandemic era. So the rationale here in brief is that COVID-19 may provide the much needed shock for the tourism industry to begin transitioning to sustainable tourism development. And the resilience adaptive cycle has these four phases. The first one is a collapse. So COVID-19 might have caused a significant, although not total collapse of the international tourism system. The second phase is called reorganization and that refers to the phase where people and communities are responding to or adapting to change through creativity and innovation. That is followed by a period of growth. And that relates to our ability to exploit the opportunities that arise. 
And here I would just like to emphasize that talking about growth does not necessarily have to correspond only to growth in GDP or growth in other economic terms, but it could equally refer to, let's say, growth in well being. And then we have a fourth phase called consolidation. And that refers to the establishment of new institution practices and rules. And that's not to be mistaken with rigid or fixed new structures, because remember that the only constant that we can rely on when we're talking about resilience is that change is constant and that tourism is adapting. And by failing to adapt to its surrounding context, tourism will either perish or it might spark a new cycle. And so it continues. So speculating about the future of tourism in a post pandemic era is of course risky because it's filled with uncertainties. Lou et al in the study I'm citing here, however propose that there are different alternative future scenarios that might be wor worth considering which as at minimum can offer us a starting point for discussing where tourism might go next. So the first scenario they present is a return to the past. And here the argumentation is that co the COVID-19 will spark a return to the past or alternatively, tourism will likely go back to business as usual, how things were before the crisis. Scenario two is that the COVID-19 pandemic will be able to give way for replacing old values with new values that allow for alternative realities to emerge. And that include new business models and policies. And as we begin experimenting with such alternatives, new opportunities could emerge and spark a new cycle of resilience as noted here by the yellow dotted line, indicating a possible route towards a future utopia. So if, if we were all physically present in a classroom right now, I would ask you what scenario is it going to be? And then secondly, I would ask you, does it have to be either or? In the following, I will offer you some snippets of variations of interpretation that have arisen since tourism scholars first began wondering and addressing how the new post-pandemic new normal will look like for tourism sustainability. And before I present these variations of interpretation, I would just like to emphasize again that these variations are again um, subject to considerable amount of uncertainty. Uh, the studies are primarily conceptual rather than based on empirical analysis because these data does not yet exist. Scenario one is referred to as return to the past. And the argumentation in this scenario is that governments are currently concerned with restarting domestic economies and generating employment. And we have seen that because a series of economic stimulation packages and interventions have been put into place, especially targeting tourism businesses without necessarily requiring that the businesses receiving those stimulation packages or subsidies will have to meet any sustainability requirements. So this might come to reinforce pre-pandemic business as usual, seeking to continue rather than change or redistribute the growth of tourism. So given the likelihood that the recovery from COVID-19 might be more of the same. Some authors have even warned that we should be very careful what we are actually wishing for. And relatedly, others speculate whether the COVID-19 pandemic is going to generate a return to an even more unsustainable past. And that is based on the strong business and political desire to get the economy, including tourism,
back to normal as soon as possible. And that could encourage businesses to overcompensate for lost revenue. And in that pursuit, it's likely that they will be less concerned about social and, and environmental issues as they seek to ensure their own survival. For instance, some scholars speculate whether the unused assets from, for instance, airlines or cruise ships that have not been bailed out by government, governments will allow for further deregulation and new low cost ventures in a time of cheap capital and a time in need of employment. In this scenario, it could place tourism on an even more unsustainable path. Still others argue that we are currently witnessing an unprecedented level of creativity and innovation, implying that we might already now have embarked upon a new path of alternative realities. And we know that we, we are having an online class session right now, right? Because among others, video conferences, home offices, and so on, have reduced non-essential air travel. And we also see that there have been a rise in domestic tourism, in, and that in some cases, this rise in domestic tourism has created new job opportunities, and not at least, it has enabled residents to reappreciate their own cultures and countries. I'm not sure how many Norwegians we have in here, but I can say during lockdown in Norway, a new concept uh, arose called Norwesferie, and it's untranslatable, but it means Norway holiday, as we two years in a row uh, could only do our holidays in Norway. And just to add to these alternative realities, there are also studies that show that due to COVID-19, we bite more, we do more outdoor activities, and others even link this increase in outdoor activities with increased mental health benefits, especially for women. So, several argue that the lessons learned from COVID-19 could put tourism on a path that is better aligned with sustainability by addressing sensitive issues such as over-tourism and climate change, perhaps offering glimpses towards utopia. And here it's important to note that the debates spin around whether we are going to grow or degrow tourism, whether we are going to return or reform tourism, and what the implications might be in these different scenarios. On the one hand, critics, critics argue that there's a need to degrow and reform tourism. So that could imply that we need to fly less, we need to put restrictions on tourist numbers to avoid repeating what we can fairly call the mistakes of the past, including unplanned and uncontrolled expansion of tourism. On the other hand, we see that critics of the critics argue that Degrowing tourism could contribute to increased poverty, especially in the developing parts of the world that are highly dependent upon tourism and are currently also disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, one of the things we can conclude is that there's no shortcoming to these variations of interpretation of tourism recovery and resilience. Just consider some of these uh, snippets from, from, a, from some of the studies that have emerged in response to the COVID-19, where re researchers argue that COVID-19 might present a fog in the road that will enable us to reboot, rediscover, reset, revive, redefine, rebound, rehabilitate, recalibrate, regenerate, remake and rethink tourism and its relations to sustainable development. So even though all these studies points in a multitude of directions, it's nonetheless the case that we can see tourism scholars have united behind two key arguments. One, tourism 
before COVID-19 was unsustainable. Two, something needs to change. However, it's important to note that resilience, as we just talked about before, is a system property. And that means that resilience says anything, it says little, if anything, about whether these post-pandemic tourism scenarios are better or worse, good or bad. Consider, for instance, the invas invasive oysters in the Danish Wadden Sea World Heritage Sites, where I did much of my fieldwork as part of my PhD project. The invasive oysters have disturbed the ecosystem of the Wadden Sea. And that's an ecosystem on which millions of birds depend. We are talking about 12 to 13 million migratory birds who depend on that area each year. Starving birds or not, because these birds depend on the mussels that are below the oysters, these oysters are the quintessential expression of a living, resilient community. These oysters plan to go nowhere. And second, I would like you to consider the words of Tracy Washington. Tracy Washington is the president of the Louisiana Justice Institute. And she requested that policymakers and the media stop calling Hurricane Katrina victims for resilient. Stop calling me resilient was the message of the public campaign that she launched across New Orleans. And she explained it like this, and I'm just going to read up a quote, quote from her. Every time you say, oh, they're resilient, it actually means that you can do something else, something new to me and my community. We were not born to be resilient, but we are conditioned to be resilient. I don't want to be resilient. I want you to fix the things that create the need for us to be or become resilient in the first place. So this objection to being called resilient speaks loudly to current understandings of resilience in tourism. Recall the definition that I offered you earlier on resilience. It emphasized that making people, communities, and systems better prepared to withstand catastrophic events, being able to bounce back stronger, being able to bounce back more quickly, and being able to survive no matter the type of stress or shock that is imposed on them. So inspired by the work of Kaika 2007, we could ask, what if we take Tracy Washington's objections seriously? What if we stop focusing on how can we make tourism destinations more resilient, no matter what stresses they encounter, which would only mean that those living there should be able to take more suffering, depreciation, or environmental degradation in the future. So if we take seriously Tracy Washington's objection, it could encourage us to redirect our attentions towards the underlying conditions that create the need for us to be or become resilient in the first place. So recognizing past shortcomings of sustainability, in 2015, a very significant pledge was made and it was made by world leaders and they um, ratified that it to shift the world onto a sustainable and resilient path by 2030. In the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, it became ratified that we resolve to build a better future for all people, including the millions who have been denied the chance to lead decent, dignified and rewarding lives and to achieve their full potential. And then note this, 
We can be the first generation to succeed in ending poverty, just as we might be the last that have a chance of saving the planet. So intended to be universal in scope and yet sensitive to contextual differences between countries, this transformative pledge has been backed by 17 goals for sustainable development that address areas that are evaluated as critical for humanity and the planet. Each of these 17 goals for sustainable development are further backed by a long list of no less than 169 targets of action and 330 indica indicators that specify their achievement. So we have entered the critical decade now where we actually have to deliver on this transformative pledge. And it's only fair to ask, well, how is it then going, progressing towards sustainability in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic? And here there are two key arguments. First, the lack of support for ensuring progress towards the 17 sustainable development goals made especially the de developing countries more vulnerable to the pandemic than they actually had to be if only the sustainable development goals had been be better embraced by the world. Had they been better embraced, it would have meant stronger health systems and expanded social protection around the world. Second, the pandemic is likely to further undermine commitment and progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals, which notably already were off track before COVID-19 hit the world. In the, in the most recent 2021 Sustainable Development Goals Progress Report that the United Nations produce each year, it is revealed that for the first time in more than 20 years, global extreme poverty has, uh, is rising. Up to 124 million people have been pushed back into extreme poverty in 2020. Income differences are rising and that also includes that violence against women and girls has intensified and child marriage is expected to rise. We are also facing continued biodiversity loss and the climate change continues largely unchanged. So crises such as COVID-19 present us not only with a tourism crisis to recover from, being a global health crisis, COVID-19 has exposed and in several cases even augmented existing environmental, social, economic and political crisis as noted by the quote I have inserted here. And I'm just going to read it out loud because I think it's, it's very sharply put. So clearly the COVID-19 pandemic is more than a global health crisis to address. It's a justice issue following years of unsustainable growth, growing conflict, inequity and injustice. In addition to these socioeconomic impacts, the crisis is undermining commitments to address critical environmental issues, including climate change. And to this, I would just like to add that the, these deep inequities stand to be further exacerbated by the existential threat of climate change, including extreme weather, rising sea level and loss of food security and the displacing of populations. Tourism, however, is deeply implicated in all of these challenges and crises. So if we argue that COVID-19 and the recovery of tourism is a mirror of the world, then it has revealed a highly unequal world. To illustrate, just consider the strikingly uneven COVID-19 vaccine rollout across the globe. In January, we could read the news about a $50,000 US dollar um, package holiday that included private jets to Dubai, where the customer receives a COVID-19 vaccine as a, at a private facility and gets 30 nights accommodation while they wait for their second dose. And Emirates Airlines were even offering an additional insurance to help cover 
the funeral costs should the traveler die from the virus during the holiday. By contrast, as affluent Western countries have now started injecting even a third booster vaccine, consider how in the beginning of September, the World Health Organization reported that just 2% of the over 5 billion doses given globally have been administered in Africa. Only around 3% of Africa's population is fully vaccinated compared to around 77% in Norway. And in the absence of vaccine, each hour 26 African dies from COVID-19. And this was in the beginning of September. Already in 1987, the World Commission on Environment and Development, also known as the Brundtland Commission, identified that the crisis of humanity and the challenges of sustainability are interlocking. Today, 34 years onwards, COVID-19 has accentuated how the vexing challenges of poverty inequality, health, well-being, and climate change remain interlocked, interrelated, and interconnected. So the question is whether, whether COVID-19 has exposed the limits of conventional framings of sustainability. And how can we begin undoing these conventional sustainability models? Models that may be may be problematic for several reasons, such as being linear, reductionist, narrowly focused on economic growth and not taking seriously issues of inequity. These are broad and important topics and nuances that I hope we will pick up on later today. Suffice is here to note that the COVID-19 pandemic has made it abundantly clear how sustainability cannot re be reduced to 17 goals to be solved one by one, nor are there 330 indicators measuring only progress to their specific goals that will achieve sustainability. So how can we stop claiming that sustainability can be reduced to a set of predefined indicators? So in the in the last few slides, I would like to offer some innovative uh, examples on how several individuals and communities across the globe have started undoing conventional tourism sustainability approaches and models. In this respect, the Amsterdam model presents, Amsterdam presents an interesting model. When COVID-19 hit the Netherlands in 2020, it emptied the, city of, emptied the city of visitors literally overnight. And we could read online and in newspapers that residents actually described this situation as a blessing in disguise, as the otherwise permanent noise, litter, and tourists peeing in the streets were suddenly re replaced with a newfound tranquility. So to Amsterdamers, a return to pre-pandemic tourism numbers became a threat rather than a promise. Locals who for years had been told that tourism should be sustainable without much agreement or consensus on in terms of what sustainable tourism might look like, um, has now initiated a series of initi initiatives that better align with the city strategy that visitors are welcome, but not at any price. For instance, the city has created practices to prevent souvenir shops from displacing local businesses and developers from turning residential spaces into holiday lets and introduced measures to reduce so-called incivilities and for the just uh, I had to check what incivilities meant. So I assume perhaps there are others also wondering what incivilities might cover. It means littering and public urination in the streets. And that was an issue that was often accredited, accredited 
to these no strings attached or party visitors in Amsterdam. So this Amsterdam model is interesting, not in terms of its ability to generate resilience, but rather because it in a very radical way enabled locals and residents to reclaim their commons through alternative values and means of allocating and managing resources. So this is my last slide. And just to return to the topic of this lecture, rethinking sustainability for resilient and recovered tourism in a post pandemic area. I have this uh, quote that I would like to share with you, a recent study that described this process of undoing conventional models, because the undoing on con of conventional models create new spaces and opportunities to engage with complexity, promote efforts to make connections and break down silos, and allows for different sustainability thinking and action to emerge through engagement with actors whose voices are less commonly heard. So this argumentation ties, closely, ties closely into the notion of resourcefulness. And resourcefulness, instead of resilience, refers to our, our capacity, our shared capacity to behave together for the common good, wherein existing knowledge can extend, interrelate, coexist, and when new ideas and relationships can emerge and thereby enabling us perhaps um, to better connect the recovery of tourism with the underlying values that inform sustainable development. In closing, if the renewed calls for recovery and resilience of tourism in a post pandemic era remain wedded in old reductionist models and ways of thinking about sustainability, chances are that it might come to serve as once conceptualized by Weaver, as a paradigm nudge as opposed to a paradigm shift. And that is engaging in opportunistic adaptions to the dominant paradigm, as opposed to addressing the root problems that create the need for us to be or become resilient in the first place. So, that is my trial lecture. I would like to say thank you for listening. And as I said in the beginning, this is really a, a time and a topic with a lot of uncertainties. These are some perspectives or thoughts from, from my part, but I'm very curious to hear as to what you might be thinking. So feel free to share any inputs or perspectives or, or questions that you might have.